Good morning, everyone who's joining us here at CSIS in Washington, D.C. Good day if you're tuning in uh, from Australia. I'm Charles E. Dell, Senior Advisor and the Australia Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I'm thrilled to welcome everyone here today uh, to our discussion of Australia's recently released Defense Strategic Review with one of its co-leads, Sarangus Houston. Uh, before we begin our conversation today, I'd like to thank Secretary William Cohen uh, from the Cohen Group for partnering with us on bringing this event here today. Now, let me note at the top that there was some disappointing uh, news overnight that, of course, the President uh, has postponed his trip to Papua New Guinea and Australia. But it's important to note that despite the day-to-day, -day, the work of government continues apace. And in many ways, there is no more important work than what we're here to discuss today. Uh, last year, uh, the Australian government announced that it would undertake a defense strategic review, which was intended to allow the new government to review the country's defense strategy and respond to what Richard Marles, the Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister, has characterized as, quote, the toughest strategic environment Australia has encountered in over 70 years. On April 24th, Canberra released an unclassified version of the DSR, which many observers has held as the most consequential defense review of the last three and a half decades at least. Today, to discuss the DSR and its findings, we're lucky to be joined by one of the two co-leads of that study, Sir Angus Houston. Sir Angus was chief of the Australian Defence Forces from 2005 to 2011, and prior to that he served as the chief of the Australian Air Force from 2001 to 2005. He retired from the military in 2011 after 41 years of service to his nation. Air Marshal, Air Chief Marshal Sir Angus Houston was awarded the Knight of the Order of Australia in January 2015 for extraordinary and preeminent achievement and merit in service to Australia through distinguished service in the Australian Defence Forces, continued commitment to serve the nation leadership roles, particularly the national responses to MH370 and MH17. Along with his role as Senior Counselor for the Cohen Group, Sir Angus serves as Chair of many charitable organisations and is a board member of the Lowy Institute and a visiting fellow at the Australian National University's National Security College. More important than all of that credentialing, however, in 2011, he was named the Australian Father of the Year. And in 2012, to beat that, he was the ACT Australia Australian of the Year. Uh, before jumping into our discussion uh, with Sir Angus, I'd first like to thank Secretary Cohen, uh, Chairman and Founder of the Cohen Group, uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Senator and Congressman from the great state of Maine, and a CSIS uh, board trustee for over 20 years uh, for partnering with us to host today's event. I'd like to invite Secretary Cohen up uh, to make some introductory remarks first. You can tell there's been no coordination between what Charlie just said about Sir Angus and my comments here. Uh, totally preempted about the accolades I was going to direct to you, uh, Sir Angus other than to say I have been associated with CSIS for a long time. Uh, CIS, CSIS has played a major role in certainly structuring our, making recommendations to structure our own government. Something called Go Water Nichols many years ago was undertaken and supported very strongly uh, by CSIS and but for that support from CSIS, uh, I doubt whether it ever would have been implemented. So. Uh, I'm delighted to be here now as a trustee of this great uh, institution, and thank you very much for allowing us to partner uh, with CSIS. And to, to say that I'm really anxious to hear from uh, Sir Angus. Uh, he is a quiet man, um, but he is, uh, beware of the men who are quiet and say little and listen a lot and understand what is going on in the world. Uh, Sir Angus, has been mentioned, has been the co-chair uh, of this most recent strategic uh, study, defense study. And um, Australia, as you know, has played a major role in the security of the United States and that of the globe. 
Australia has been with the United States in every war in recent memory. And so we look to Australia as being um, our key partner, treaty partner, going back to 1951, uh, and now uh, broadening that, deepening that, and making an even stronger relationship. So, Sir Angus, I'm pleased to um, introduce you. I'm glad you're back with the Cohen Group, having had to uh, disqualify yourself from active engagement with us, and uh, you're now back home with us, and we're really delighted to hear you. Thanks very much. So if it's okay with everyone, uh, we're going to skip speeches uh, because there's a lot to discuss here. Um, we have about an hour. Uh, we'll see, uh, despite being a quiet man, despite being a man of few words, uh, how many questions we can get through because there really is just a ton in at least the publicly released 110-page version of the Defense Strategic Review uh, that came out. So let me start at the top. Uh, why did the Albanese government undertake this review? What was it hoping to accomplish? Well, I think you covered most of it um, in your introduction, but uh, our strategic circumstances uh, have been going downhill for a long time, and uh, uh, I would characterize them myself as the worst strategic circumstances, certainly in my lifetime. Um, and warning time for conventional uh, uh, conflict uh, at, for the first time in my experience had uh, been assessed as going be below 10 years. So warning time is reducing, strategic circumstances uh, are uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very challenging and the government, new government comes to power and the first thing they do is uh, order a defence strategic review. And uh, I think the other thing that's significant about that, and we want you guys to do it in six months. <laughs> uh, now that's a tall order when you consider that white papers normally take uh, uh, one and a half uh, to two years, and that's what we had traditionally done in the past. But such is the urgency of our strategic circumstances uh, we needed to do this thing very, very quickly. And I, I would say there was a, a, a high degree of urgency across the board in terms of getting this thing done. So the new government comes in, decides it's going to stand up this strategic review and that it needs to proceed at great pace. What happens next? The phone rings, uh, you get drafted in with Stephen Smith, uh, was it the PM who called? What were the marching orders that you got actually for the breadth and scope of this DSR? Well, um, the phone call I got was from um, Richard Miles, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, he asked me if I would uh, co-lead this uh, review, and he said that uh, he was also going to ask Stephen Smith. Uh, and then Stephen and I uh, talked uh, and we agreed on how we might do it. And um, a team of five was formed and uh, away we went and um, you know, worked very hard over a, a six month period. Uh, the confidential report uh, delivered um, the 14th of uh, April. And uh, as you said, the uh, public version came out on the 20th. 20, 24th of uh, April. So just over six months. Uh, the government uh, has uh, agreed um, with the, uh, the substance of the report. Uh, there were 108 recommendations in the confidential version and they've accepted 105. Um, and uh, essentially um, one of the things we, we emphasise is there's going to be a need uh, for more money. And they agreed that, yes, there would be a need for more money. Uh, so while I'd really like to ask you what the three recommendations that weren't accepted uh, into that, uh, we'll hold off on that. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, when you spoke to the Deputy Prime Minister, when he asked you to stand up the review, 
What was the scope of uh, the mission? How broad was the strategic review to be? Well, it was, uh, it was very broad. Uh, we were obviously um, required to uh, assess the strategic circumstances and look at capability, uh, force posture, uh, and force structure. Uh, I think that's, if I could cut it down to a few words, that's the essence of what we were to, to look at. And what, was, uh, what they were most concerned about was, uh, is the Australian Defence Force uh, fit for purpose given uh, these strategic circumstances we have at the moment and the fact that warning time had uh, reduced? Uh, do we have the right uh, force posture, force structure, the right capabilities? Um, not to jump the gun of our conversation, because I do really want to kind of unwrap uh, what's in here, because there really is a lot. Uh, we know that the answer is no, that the uh, ADF is not fit for purpose at this point. Before we get there, you talked about the strategic circumstances as the fundamental first step that you were going to draw. Mm -hmm. and I was hoping uh, you could talk a little bit about the security circumstances, really the security challenges that the report identifies and how those have changed over time, how those have evolved even since you were CDF yourself. Okay, well where I might start, um, <clears throat> if, if we have a look at what's happened uh, uh, since the uh, Vietnam War, um, Australia experienced, uh, along with all the, uh, the nations in the region, um, 40 years of uh, peace, uh, stability and prosperity. Uh, that was all enabled by uh, uh, US military presence and uh, military power in our region. Uh, there were no conflicts. Uh, we had a, a great period of incredible uh, economic growth and it was shared by every country in the region. Uh, China, most of all, uh, benefit, benefited from uh, this period of uh, stability. But unfortunately, that's all, all changed in, uh, in recent times, and we've seen strategic circumstances uh, change because uh, the US is no longer uh, the unipolar power that it was back in those uh, 40 years. And we see intense competition uh, between the United States and China. Uh, and uh, there's always the potential for uh, uh, some form of misunderstanding uh, or miscalculation uh, that could result in some sort of uh, serious incident or uh, even worse, uh, some form of conflict. Uh, add to that the fact that the uh, Chinese have moved in uh, very assertively uh, to uh, suggest, uh, well, assert the sovereignty, uh, their sovereignty over the South China Sea and the, uh, the reefs and uh, very small islands that are, are there. That contravenes the global, uh, uh, global rules-based order and from an Australian point of view, uh, certainly uh, undermines our national interest. Uh, the South China Sea is incredibly important to us. Um, a lot of our trade comes through the South China Sea. Uh, and at, at the present, uh, most of our fuel uh, comes through the South China Sea. Uh, and add to that um, the fact that uh, uh, China's also been uh, involved in uh, strategic competition in our near neighbourhood. Uh, areas where uh, we've been expected to carry the, uh, the weight of the security of that region. So uh, I think that just about covers it all. Oh, and the other thing, of course, <coughs> the incredible build-up of military power, uh, the like of which we've never seen since the Second World War. An incredible uh, uh, capability built up in a very short period of time. Uh, and no transparency uh, and no assurance, no explanation about why uh, such a huge uh, built-up has occurred. And indeed, uh, these are my words, not the DSR's words, uh, not only the opaque build-up, but the increasingly assertive use uh, of that increased uh, military preparedness by Beijing. 
Um, uh, this makes sense to me. Changed strategic circumstances prompting a changed defense policy. Uh, when you begin to look at the document, I, I will hold it up uh, for everyone, or at least my printout of it. It actually comes in color and glossy. You can download it right off the government website. You know, one of the most striking things uh, that comes out of this is that shift in defense policy uh, that you discuss in the report that we have a shift from a defense of Australia policy to something that is now to be called national defense. Um, that might sound innocuous, but that's a fairly uh, robust change. And I was hoping you could unpack uh, the logic of what that means, but also what new things will be required to have a national defense strategy as opposed to simply defense of Australia. Okay. Um, well, for the last, uh, I guess, 50 years or so, uh, we've had a defense of Australia uh, policy. I would say a defence of Australia policy and associated with that a balanced force yes. uh, in the ADF. And uh, uh, that balanced uh, uh, force uh, and that uh, DOA, Defence of Australia uh, uh, policy uh, was arranged against the potential for a uh, low level regional threat um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, clearly, clearly there was no, no major threat on the horizon. So that served us very well for, uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, with this um, decline in our strategic circumstances, clearly that wasn't fit for purpose, that approach. And so um, we had to go to uh, what we call national defence. Uh, now, na national defence needs to be uh, uh, nested in a much broader um, policy, uh, which would also include uh, statecraft and diplomacy, a, a national strategy, if you like. Uh, and in terms of uh, national uh, defence, um, what is important is that we have uh, active uh, statecraft, active diplomacy out there, um, basically trying to create a favourable balance, uh, regional balance of power in our region. And we need to do that working with our partners and allies. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we need uh, to have uh, a different approach uh, to defence policy. And uh, I guess national, we call it national defence, uh, and there's a, there's a long list of uh, characteristics. Uh, perhaps I just highlight the, uh, the top four uh, items uh, because I think they're probably the most <coughs> significant one, ones. The first part of uh, national defence, I guess I've already referred to it, a defence strategy uh, and policy uh, that takes account of a whole of nation um, broader uh, strategy. Um, number two, we need to enhance our alliance with the United States. And that also includes um, basically uh, the rotational uh, presence of the United States in Australia. We should further uh, develop that and uh, the alliance is incredibly Im important uh, to our security. Uh, that's <coughs> not to say that, sorry, uh, we, uh, we obviously need to be as self-reliant as we can, uh, but given our circumstances, we need that alliance. And the alliance, by the way, has served us very well uh, through many, many years. Um, then the third thing is we need a different approach to defence planning. Uh, DOA just doesn't cut it, and Defence of Australia just doesn't cut it. Uh, we need something that has a much sharper focus on where, where the threats are, and where the risks are, and we now are embracing a net assessment approach uh, to the risks and threats that we face. And then uh, lastly, um, we have a uh, recommended a military strategy 
of uh, deterrence through denial. And we must have the capability to be able to hold an adversary at risk uh, in our northern approaches. And on the map here, you can see those northern approaches. Um, I think this map uh, uh, speaks a thousand words because you can see exactly uh, where uh, a threat to Australia might, might come from. And uh, it's imperative that we are able to operate in those northern approaches north of Australia. Uh, I might leave it there. Uh, but the map is, uh, we call this the land bridge, and I think it's uh, a very uh, useful uh, aid when we start talking about uh, Australia's strategic circumstances. I'm really glad that you didn't point to the strategic threat emanating from New Zealand uh, right over here. Uh, but look, uh, what well, I found... Just, just to take it a little bit further, you can yeah. see where the geography um, right. is important. Um, the Indian Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, and of course the Southern Ocean as well. Uh, and Australia and New Zealand do focus on the Southern Ocean, but uh, at this stage, it's nice and secure. Look, the uh, four pillars uh, that you just described, I, I think, are really interesting. Do represent a fundamental shift, maybe an acceleration of what came out in the Defence Strategic Update of 2020. Uh, but that first pillar, that this is more than just defence, uh, this requires statecraft, this requires diplomacy, yeah. uh, is well taken. But this is primarily a document uh, focusing on defense policy. And I, I do want to return to something that you said earlier uh, and have you lay out what was the review's assessment of the ADF's preparedness, because there's some pretty striking language uh, in the document. Well, I think the, uh, the prepar preparedness we found uh, uh, is consistent with uh, Defense of Australia, Balanced Force, uh, and there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a, an increase in the preparedness of the force evident uh, in what we looked at. Given the strategic circumstances, I think it's very urgent uh, to in increase the preparedness of the force, uh, make it uh, more ready uh, for what might lie ahead. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's going to take, uh, that's going to take time uh, you can't turn a switch and go from uh, uh, where we are or where we were uh, to a higher, higher rate of readiness. It takes investment in, uh, um, in sustainment of uh, capability. It means uh, investing in uh, more people and it means sorting out some of the uh, very great challenges we have. And if I, I could just run through a couple of those, it might put it in context. Uh, first of all, our northern bases. Our northern bases, um, uh, Tyndall has been uh, invested in quite uh, heavily and Darwin's been invested in. Uh, so right in the centre of our north, uh, we've had uh, some investment. But the other bases, the bare bases that were put in um, back in the uh, last uh, century, um, they're in great need of remediation. So uh, they would be the platform from which we would uh, uh, basically hold uh, an adversary uh, at risk. And uh, we need to have a platform uh, to do that. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to remediate the northern bases. The second thing is fuel. Uh, fuel uh, is a real problem for us. Uh, we're talking about uh, supply, we're talking about distribution, and we're talking about storage. Uh, there's much work needed in all of those areas. I mentioned earlier uh, that most of our fuel comes through the South China Sea. So we've got to have a look at alternate ways of getting fuel to Australia. Uh, we've got to engage the, uh, uh, the civilian support that provides us with our fuel and talk to them about uh, how, we, uh, how we do distribution in a more effective way and how we store fuel in a more effective way. 
And to that end, we've recommended we set up a, uh, uh, a fuel council. Um, this will be a whole of nation uh, fuel council. Uh, industry will be heavily uh, represented and uh, they will assist us uh, in working out the best way to uh, maintain a diversification of supply uh, so we're not locked into one source of supply. And also, some of the uh, issues with distributing uh, fuel uh, to our north. Uh, and north is uh, served by very limited uh, communications, and we have to find uh, the best way to ensure we can get the fuel uh, to where the uh, ADF's capability will be based uh, in a contingency situation. Then finally, uh, if I could just use the Air Force as an example, and there's a reference in the report to it, um, the Air Force is really um, manned for benign circumstances. Uh, we need to increase the manning of critical personnel, aircrew, um, so we'll need to ramp up our uh, air, air training uh, system. We need a, a really good scalable training system so that we can uh, crew these incredibly important uh, platforms um, so that we can operate at high tempo. At the moment, uh, high tempo would be uh, beyond us. So those three ones that you just laid out, um uh, in terms of uh, northern bases, in terms of fuel, and in terms of manpower, specifically for the Air Force, but I think that's a much more that's broad just, point that you're making. Oh, that's just <clears throat> a, an example. No, uh, I gotta, I'm also hoping that you can actually draw back for a second to lay out some of the other key recommendations uh, for how the ADF uh, needs to be postured moving forward, because this does, as you've already said, pretend a real shift in what the defense strategy is, moving towards a deterrence by denial, but what other things does this entail uh, moving forward and what were highlighted in the report? Well, I suppose if you, uh, it's a very uh, complex and uh, uh, 108 recommendations and I'm not, not going to list uh, all of those. I can't. Some of them are highly classified. Uh, but if I can Just draw, three. Just draw three. it down to six, six points. Um, first of all, investing in the uh, nuclear-powered submarine as part of AUKUS. Uh, that is uh, an absolute imperative. We've got to do it as quickly as we can, and obviously it's going to take quite a bit of time. Number two, uh, developing long-range precision strike against moving targets um, as uh, quickly as we can. We have a capability already, but there's much more we need to do if we're going to go uh, uh, long range, and uh, that is clearly uh, a priority. Uh, that also means we have to uh, increase the supply of long range weapons into our uh, inventories. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've strongly recommended is that the Guided Weapon Explosive, explosive Ordnance Organisation that was set up two years ago get on with the job of uh, uh, manufacturing um, the, the sort of uh, strike missiles that we will need um, now and into the future. So that is a key priority. Um, we, we have the capability, I think, industrial capability to be able to do that, but we've got to get going. Uh, the announcement on the Guided Weapons Explosive Ordinance was made two years ago, and nothing has happened until the report came out. I'm pleased to say uh, we're seeing uh, pretty uh, quick action already, urgent action to get that properly set up so that it can deliver what we need. Uh, the third item was uh, improving the ADF's uh, capability uh, to operate from the northern bases. Again, uh, this uh, current budget, we see $4 billion committed to uh, the northern bases, and that's uh, a very urgent requirement. 
Um, the fourth thing is lifting our capacity uh, to take disruptive uh, capability that's developed by our scientists uh, and others uh, so that we can uh, take it to capability as quickly as possible. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> uh, finally, investing in the, uh, uh, the growth and retention of our people. Um, right now we have uh, shortages of skilled people across the board. Uh, and again, the government's responded very quickly to our recommendation. Current budget that came out uh, about 10 days ago, almost a billion dollars is going into, uh, into people. And then uh, the final one, uh, deepening our uh, diplomatic and defence relationships with our partners and friends. Uh, and that's, that's where this uh, statecraft comes in. The statecraft needs to really uh, lift to a new level so that we can engage uh, all the small countries in the South Pacific, all of the nations in our region, in Southeast Asia, and of course our very important partners, the United States, uh, the Quad partners, and uh, the whole raft of uh, uh, bilateral, trilateral, and minilateral relationships uh, that we, we have, and also a couple of really big multilateral uh, relationships. We've really got to get out there and uh, uh, use the opportunities. Um, I, I want to stay on the force for a second before we get to the statecraft or before we get to the budget, because I think that's a really important point of discussion. Uh, as former CDF, uh, I imagine that some of the recommendations, uh, there are some things that are on the chopping blocks, indeed, must have been uh, difficult. And I'd like to hear, in particular, your take about the future of the Australian Army, because there is a fairly large restructuring uh, that is talked about for the Australian Army. Can you talk about uh, the Army's role in the new DSR? Well, I think the Army is probably the, uh, the service that's uh, most affected by um, the move from a balanced force uh, to a more focused force. And the focus force, because we're going to be operating uh, in the north, it needs to be able to operate in the uh, littoral um, areas in northern Australia and uh, offshore islands. And uh, there hasn't been a sharp focus on that previously. So that's, uh, that's a major change for the Army. Uh, and we have to invest in uh, the modern landing, heavy landing craft uh, that can carry uh, armoured capability uh, and everything we would need if we're involved in a conflict in the littoral of our own nation or uh, perhaps uh, um, a country offshore. So um, that's a, a high priority, uh, highest priority for the Army. And in addition to that, Army needs to uh, provide a long-range strike capability. Uh, we're buying HIMARS, and we're involved in the development of the missile family uh, that will come with that uh, through the next few years. And that will give us a very potent long-range uh, strike capability. And we want the Army to also have a maritime strike capability. In addition to that, uh, we talked a lot about... Do you mind if I actually stop you right there, just to ask about that particular point? Yep. Uh, because uh, when we move from Army to Navy, um, one of the critiques uh, that the DSR has received is that a fairly fulsome report, yes, but on the Navy, it punts. It calls for another review, uh, another quick review, but about what the Navy's future shipbuilding requirements should look like. Okay. Um, yep, please. Yep, yep. I'll come to that. Let me just finish off with the Army. Um, the North, uh, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure. There's not many people live up there. So there's going to be a requirement for the Army to protect the infrastructure in the North. Okay? So that will be a job for the uh, Army Reserve. Now, getting to uh, uh, the ships, the Navy. Um, and uh, we have a, an officer in the audience who's from the Navy. Uh, great to see you here today. Um, and 
essentially the um, uh, the Navy, uh, we think the Navy needs to have much better lethality. Um, to have um, uh, a tier two uh, type ships, the offshore patrol vessels, being totally unarmed just isn't a acceptable. So uh, we think, uh, we think that increased lethality is very important in our tier one ships and our tier two ships. Uh, and uh, the key question for us is, well, what's the right mix? Uh, particularly as the, uh, uh, the thinking over here in the United States is suggesting that uh, there's probably a need to move to uh, smaller ships. So we felt that there was a need for further analysis into all of those things. And uh, in terms of sh shipbuilding, we have to think of all of that in the context of a policy of continuous <coughs> shipbuilding uh, in Australia. And what do I mean by that? Just continuous shipbuilding where we keep churning uh, ships out uh, you know, on a regular production line. So we've got, uh, obviously, uh, uh, shipbuilding going on at the moment. Uh, we had a concern about uh, uh, the delivery of the capability, uh, what it would look like. Um, we were concerned uh, also about uh, the cost of the program. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the associated uh, schedule and the risks. And at this stage, the first vessel off the, uh, the line that's uh, under production at the moment uh, would arrive in the early 2030s. We think we need uh, more lethality before we get to that point. And of course, we have to consider uh, continuous uh, shipbuilding uh, policy as well. Um, with the idea of more needed sooner, uh, that generally equates with more expensive uh, as well. And I do want to talk a little bit about the budget. Mm. Um, why? Uh, was it not provided in actually granular number in the DSR itself? Uh, let me uh, quote uh, Peter Leahy, the former uh, chief of the Australian Army, has written publicly uh, just last week that the review moves the dial towards strategic reality, but it hasn't yet introduced the necessary budget. Uh, a less charitable reading uh, than that would be to say that the rhetoric that we have in the DSR uh, is it disconnected from the budget that we've seen put forward? And I would just ask you, can we judge the DSR independent of the budget that the government puts forward? Look, I, I think this is um, <laughs> uh, governments decide on, uh, on budgets, right? Um, let's start at the beginning. We, we have a recommendation in the report more money will be required uh, for defence to implement this, this report. Uh, there is a clear-cut uh, recommendation. The government has accepted that recommendation. Bear in mind, this, this has been produced in six months. Um, there are 3,300 uh, lines in the integrated investment plan, right? Each of those lines has... Uh, um, a sum of money associated with it. So um, uh, I guess uh, what we've seen thus far, uh, the current budget, um, $52 uh, billion, in fact $52.6 billion, uh, that's double the budget uh, that I had uh, when I was CDF. So. There's, there have been significant increases to the point we're now running at 2.1% of GDP. And not a lot of countries in the world, um, in the Western world, who invest at that level in defence. Um, in addition to that, this, uh, this current defence budget, that was an increase of 2% over the previous year. And then in terms of uh, the government's uh, plans for the DSR, 
the Deputy Prime Minister has made it very clear uh, that there's a commitment to increase from 2.1% of GDP uh, to 2.3% in the medium term. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's good. Uh, the other thing is there's an allocation of $19 billion in the uh, four years going forward uh, for the, uh, the DSR. Uh, $7.8 billion of that will come from a reprioritisation of uh, the integrated investment plan and uh, that's, a, that's a major undertaking as you could imagine. And then just to lay out uh, what came out of the last uh, budget, uh, $9 billion uh, for the nuclear powered submarine, uh, $4 billion for long range strike. $4 billion for the northern bases and a $1 billion for people. So uh, there has been investment and I think Peter's being, uh, Peter knows how the system works. At the end of the day, it's not for the uh, Defence Strategic Review to uh, basically allocate the budget uh, for the recommendations. That is always the job of government and the National Security Committee of Cabinet spent a lot of time uh, looking at this uh, together with the, uh, uh, the other reviews of budget that are, um, are done by the Australian government to come up with this. Bear in mind, um, the other thing you should bear in mind, that the, when this government came to power, uh, there was a $42 billion pressure on the defence budget already. So uh, that's, uh, that was a sh huge challenge, particularly in an environment where uh, they came to power on a promise to uh, improve cost of living, to uh, improve health care, uh, to improve old age care and uh, a number of other things. So there are great demands on, on the budget and uh, I think we'll see where it goes into the future. But 2.3%, I would have given my eye teeth for that when I was CDF. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I find out most intriguing uh, to emerge out of the entire report is this move towards net assessment, uh, right, which really predicates uh, spending levels and preparedness uh, based not on numbers, but in response to a dynamic, evolving situation. Uh, so sometimes, you know, it's worth asking the question about whether or not hitting percentage goals is as important as keeping pace with how quickly others are moving in the area. I guess one final question for you before we take some uh, questions from the audience, and I think you've started laying this out uh, about metrics for success. Uh, again, you've laid out a full report, a full suite of recommendations, but I guess the question is, what would lead you to conclude that the work of this uh, has been successful. What metrics would you look at uh, for judging whether or not this is actually implemented? Uh, I haven't thought about metrics at this stage. Um, we have uh, put in place, uh, right at the end of the report, you'll see uh, there's going to be o oversight of the implementation at three levels. And uh, I think that's going to be a very uh, searching process. Uh, so defence is going to have to uh, uh, demonstrate progress against their implementation plan on a very regular basis. And initially that will be uh, probably on a monthly basis and then one, once things settle down uh, a quarterly basis. So you will have a um, uh, first of all, the first level will be the um, CDF and the Secretary. Uh, the next level uh, is a, uh, an independent and external uh, uh, group of people. Uh, and above that is the uh, National Security Committee of Cabinet. And uh, each of those, uh, uh, those bodies will the CDF and the Secretary will report to the external uh, oversighters 
and then the external oversighters will put a report into the National Security Committee of Cabinet, which will obviously be carried there by the Deputy Prime Minister as the Defence Minister. Yeah. Well, I commend you, especially on that recommendation that's tucked away towards the back of this, because uh, as we always say, strategy is a two-step game. It's not just conception, it's execution. And there actually are some provisions here about oversight and implementation. Uh, so do commend you on that. Uh, we could go all day. I have many more questions, but I do want to pause uh, go out to the audience uh, to see if there are questions. We have a uh, microphone. Uh, if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself and asking a concise question uh, for Sir Angus. Mr. Zach Cooper. Hi, Sir Angus. Good to see you again. Uh, Zach Cooper from the American Enterprise Institute. I, I want to ask a brief question about uh, Indonesia and the reception that the DSR got there. And, you know, I, I know you did a lot of uh, thinking and outreach on Indonesia specifically because the strategy really has a lot to do with the approaches to Australia, which, which means Indonesia is key. So I'd just be interested in, in um, how you thought the report was received there and some of the interactions you've, you've had with uh, government and experts. Thanks. I, I, haven't, I haven't followed closely uh, the reaction uh, in Indonesia, uh, but I will be going up there um, as uh, we have a program called Ikahan. Um, you know that, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, myself and some other senior people, Peter Lay as well, by the way. Uh, I'll have a go at him when he gets to Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we go up and we interact. Uh, with our uh, colleagues in Indonesia who we used to work with uh, years ago. And uh, twice a year we have an interaction and we talk about everything, uh, things we probably couldn't talk about when we were in uniform. And it'll be very interesting. I'm sure I'll be asked to talk about the DSR uh, and uh, I'll be very interested to see how uh, that process goes at that stage. So I wouldn't like to make a comment prior to uh, going there, but uh, uh, as the map shows, um, and as history shows, uh, Second World War, um, Indonesia is, uh, is very close to us. We need to be very close to Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is a very important uh, country to us, and uh, a lot of that uh, uh, soft power statecraft needs to go into uh, Indonesia and we'll continue to maintain the very good relationship we have uh, defence to defence. Uh, we exercise with them uh, on a regular basis uh, in all domains and uh, I think the relationship's never been better. Sir? Thank you, Matt Sieber from Kymetta Corporation. Sir Angus, thank you very much for your, for your comments and your openness about the DSR. Uh, you mentioned quite a few, um, uh, I guess you, you talked about the less than 10 year warning, uh, but then you talked about many long lead items like mm. submarines, shipbuilding, mm. infrastructure improvements, things of that nature. Are you mm. able to talk about uh, what moves the needle fastest to improve Australia's uh, position in, uh, for national defense? Well, uh, I'll, I'll go straight to uh, uh, the submarine uh, is obviously going to be out there. Um, but, you know, we're going to have Virginias uh, in the early 2030s. Um, at the moment, the ships that are being built, um, they won't arrive until the early 2030s. I think the Virginia will be there before uh, the ships that are being manufactured in Australia at the moment. Uh, so. Uh, I would go straight to one thing, guided weapons and explosive ordnance. Uh, we need to uh, put the priority into every form of guided weapon uh, that is relevant to our force. And I'm talking about not just the uh, uh, really long range uh, weapons, but also uh, we need more uh, other weapons as well. Um, we shouldn't, we need to go for what we can get quickly. And um, 
one of the uh, missile families that I'm sure we will uh, uh, spend a lot of time looking at and working with is the uh, Kongsberg uh, uh, JSM NSM. They produce a, uh, a missile that uh, can be, you can put two JSMs in a JSF in the bomb bay. Uh, it's the only missile that will fit in a JSF, so I'm sure uh, we'll be uh, looking at that. Uh, in fact, it's in the report. Uh, and uh, the other one is, is the same missile is uh, also uh, able to be used as the NSM on naval ships. So I think there needs to be um, some movement there urgently. Uh, and uh, if we can get a manufacturing uh, um, set up of that missile in Australia, that would be a very good thing. Uh, Let's go to the perhaps the more expensive and uh, exotic missiles. We need to be able to manufacture those in Australia too. So um, obviously the two companies that are involved in uh, GUIO are going to be Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. And they both produce families <coughs> of uh, missiles uh, that we'll be procuring anyway uh, but we think it's also important to develop a capability uh, of some of those missiles in Australia, manufacture them in Australia. Uh, I'm going to go to a question first that we received online from Gary Sprott of the Indo-Pacific Defence Forum. Um, uh, Gary wrote that the DSR notes the importance of, quote, working with partners investing in their own defence capabilities. Uh, Serengas, can you talk more about Australia's efforts to enhance the security capabilities of Pacific Island countries, uh, such as PNG, uh, Vanuatu, and others? Well, perhaps if I talk about Papua New Guinea, we've had a, a long, long relationship with Papua New Guinea. Um, we've always, uh, we've always uh, provided them with uh, assistance uh, to develop their defence force. Uh, I can remember as a very young officer going up there and working with them um, were the Pacific Islands uh, regiments. Very fine soldiers uh, and uh, really enjoyed the experience. But going forward, uh, there are capabilities that they want to develop uh, and uh, uh, we need to invest in those capabilities. For example, an air capability um, and uh, we we think there's a great scope to uh, develop a, an air wing uh, that will be uh, very useful to them. Uh, we already uh, provide them with uh, patrol boats, uh, but we probably need to develop even further the, the sort of support that we provide them. And the other thing is we need to uh, exercise with all of these countries and um, uh, Papua New Guinea is a very challenging environment, as we saw in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, I think exercises in, uh, in New Guinea uh, will be very valuable to developing the, uh, uh, the sort of capability we need and also uh, providing uh, um, everybody involved with familiarity <laughs> with a very demanding and challenging environment. Uh, Ma'am? Jennifer, Jennifer Hong from Project 2049. Good to see you again. Um, would you be able to add a little bit more color uh, or information to just the priorities? It, it means um, space domain. Yeah. Um, so I know that there are some concerns from the larger Australian budget that the space programs are maybe um, in a precarious position, maybe possibly being impacted. Would love to hear about um, just your assessment. Well, just very quickly, just. Um, one of the things we didn't get to is the uh, uh, Australian Defence Force. It will be a fully integrated defence force across the five domains. Uh, obviously, uh, sea, air, land, space and cyber. And uh, they will be uh, the domains. The space domain is very, very important to us. And uh, we've recommended moving it out of Air Force and placing it under the, uh, uh, the Joint Capability uh, Commander. 
uh, and it will uh, obviously be uh, funded uh, through him. Um, we've had some really good assistance from um, actually the uh, um, General Crider uh, has been down there assisting uh, uh, the commander of uh, the Australian Space uh, Command, Cath Roberts, uh, Air Vice Marshal Cath Roberts, and uh, it's moving forward apace. It's a very uh, brand, it's a brand new capability, uh, but it's, uh, it's growing apace and uh, we're very happy with how, how it's going at this stage. And of course, uh, uh, just that the government recently uh, made the decision on uh, Program 9102, uh, which is uh, uh, satellite communications, and those satellite communications will be provided by uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, a very sophisticated and uh, comprehensive uh, SATCOM system. Does that give you uh, what you want? You wanted more than that, I yeah, think. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't being reprioritized in the defense no, space. Okay. No, no. Yeah. Quite the contrary. In fact, um, I can't speak about some of the things um, that we want to do there uh, because it's highly classified and very sensitive. But believe me, it's a very, very high priority. Absolutely key uh, to the, uh, the best uh, utilization of the Australian Defence Force. Uh, so it's not, it's not a sort of uh, a side organization. It is, a, it is one of the domains uh, in an integrated defence force. And if you just think about some of the things I've talked about today, uh, space has a very big part to play in all of that. Um, one of the questions that we received online, but it's really a topic of constant conversation here in Washington, D.C., is export controls and the U.S. export control regime. And I guess I would ask uh, specifically from your experience uh, when you were CDF, uh, if you can think of instances where the U.S. export control regime, I'm talking about ITAR, I'm talking about tech transfer, uh, posed problems uh, for planning or even for force preparedness for Australia. Well, uh, in my time, it wasn't a problem. Um, and I, I say that because um, what we were dealing with was uh, the Middle East. Um, uh, we decided we wanted uh, C-17s. Uh, the C-17s were delivered in less than two years. We decided we needed uh, um, an air combat aircraft uh, to cover the gap. Uh, between the F-111 and uh, the JSF. Um, so we were able to obtain uh, Super Hornets in less than two years, uh, bought through FMS, of course, uh, which is the best way to, uh, to buy um, a capability like that. Uh, but I, I guess where, where it comes in is uh, not so much in, uh, in the sort of operational environment, that we've experienced in the recent past. It's where we want to go in the future and we want a particular uh, item. It's a torturous process to go through all the various uh, controls and approvals that are required for us to obtain, say, um, a strike weapon. Uh, I think that's where it, uh, it really uh, uh, <coughs> comes into play. And one of the things about AUKUS, uh, that AUKUS Pillar 2, that I hope we uh, really uh, get sorted, is uh, all of those um, uh, sharing of information, sharing of technology, ITARs, uh, all of that um, we need as part of AUKUS Pillar 2 uh, to level the playing field so we can get the, uh, the kit um, <coughs> Uh, much quicker uh, and without all of the, uh, the steps uh, that are required at the moment. So I think that's where, it, that's where it comes in and that's where it's more relevant. It's when we start procuring stuff, 
um, it can be quite a, a long process. That's a, it's an interesting note to conclude on. Uh, you started with uh, the conversation about whether or not uh, the Australian Defence Forces are fit for purpose. Uh, there's an, a question here too uh, for US uh, allies about whether or not uh, the systems that we have are fit for purpose for the new environment uh, that we are facing at this point. Um, before we wrap, I just want to ask, we got to space uh, towards the last moments. Uh, is there anything else that we really need to take away that we haven't covered? Uh, we really have covered a fair amount, but as you said, probably not all 110 pages worth. Well, just, just a few words about uh, the Australian Defence Force. Uh, I just, in response to the question, um, we are going to, we're going beyond joint, we're going to integrate it, a fully integrated uh, Defence Force. We'll still have an Army, Air Force and Navy, but we've got those other domains as well. And the Chief of the Defence Force uh, will have uh, uh, command, he ha already has command, but he will have control of the personal management uh, function. So promotion of officers, career management of officers will be handled by the CDF. Um, this is a marked change from uh, where we've been in the past. And uh, I think this is a huge step in the right direction uh, because uh, people were promoted uh, by their service chief. So if they were in a joint appointment, they're always worried about what dad thinks. What does dad think about my performance here in the joint environment? And sometimes in the joint environment, you have to do things that probably uh, are not appreciated in the single service. So I think uh, this, is a, this is a better way to do business. It will provide for uh, a much more effective way uh, to run um, the, per the very critical uh, officer call of the uh, Australian Defence Force. So fully integrated and uh, I think in a much better way. I, I mean the joint operations work fine but this will make them uh, work even better. Well, I really do want to thank you for running through the gamut here of all the restructuring uh, that has recommended everything from uh, what the new promotion process will look like in the oversight, to the oversight to the entire enterprise, to the desire to accelerate uh, a long range strike, to northern bases, uh, to the way that Australia even can acquire uh, the new capabilities that it's looking for here. This really is a momentous document. I commend you um, and Stephen Smith uh, for pulling this off within six months, as you said, it was executed. And I hope that everyone here can join me in thanking uh, Sir Angus for taking the time to share with us today, but really for the work that he and his team put into pulling this. Thank you. <laughs>